Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to Open Rights Group's second seminar on the government's data new direction proposals to effectively, from our perspective, gut GDPR rights, and to encourage everybody to understand these proposals and then respond to the consultation uh, by, I believe it's the 19th uh, of November next week. So just, just over a week now uh, to respond. This seminar is about the impacts on the health sector and health data, which obviously is an incredibly important topic for everybody. We all have health records and we all want to believe that they are going to be uh, used in a safe and sane manner. However, this proposal has profound implications for that. And we'll be discussing that today with uh, Martin Blanchard, who is a retired doctor and academic and a medical campaign with Keep Our NHS Public, a non-party political organization campaigning against privatization and underfunding of the NHS. Um, after Martin, we have Phil Booth, who is coordinator of Med Confidential, independent non-partisan organization working with pensions and healthcare professionals to campaign for confidentiality and consent in health and social care. Many of you will know Phil, of course, from No to ID days as well. Uh, and finally, we have Mariano Delisanti, who is Open Rights Group's legal and policy officer. Uh, he works on privacy in online advertising and other areas, supports all strategic litigation and political advocacy efforts, uh, and is a data protection um, guru from our perspective, uh, and has led our uh, response um, which you can, you can read our response documents actually at uh, openrightsgroup.org forward slash stop data discrimination. Uh, and the links there are to, to many, many of these aspects we'll be discussing today to help people to craft detailed responses if that's what uh, you're going to do. So I'll pause there and I'll ask Martin to speak first, uh, who's gonna give us the general context for these proposals and reforms. So thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you. Thank you for asking me to, uh, to speak at this uh, important briefing about the way our government wishes to use our health data. Indeed, the current consultation certainly does represent a new direction for the NHS. And it seems that there are aims to cement the public-private health partnerships that have occurred to some extent over the years, but more recently have mushroomed with the involvement of private corporations in health system development and COVID management. This growth of private corporate involvement in our healthcare is important because it can directly affect the way our personal data may be used and influence any decision we may make to share it in the first place, if given the choice. I think it's useful to understand the context of this private interest, so I'll go over it briefly. In the last few decades, there have been books written by politicians wanting to privatize the NHS, and access has been given for profit to be made from state funding in non-clinical services, public finance initiatives, elective care, and diagnostics. Following the 2008 financial crash, McKinsey's paper, World Class Productivity in Healthcare, indicated the potential for 20 billion pounds savings in the NHS at that time but this plan was rejected by the Labour government that had requested it. Meanwhile, in 2010 in the US, there was what to many was the huge commercial and ideological threat of the Affordable Care Act, which was only agreed, albeit in a limited fashion, because of accountable care systems designed specifically to contain costs. And we know that corporations are currently getting rich using these systems with Medicaid funding. So it's possible to do it. Then in Switzerland, McKinsey's ideas reappeared in the World Economic Forum in 2012 and 2013, with the setting up of what appears to be a global multi-stakeholder initiative in sustainable healthcare, stewarded by a certain Simon Stevens, then some sort of president of the massive US corporation United Health, also known as Optum in the UK in response to the apparent threat of spiraling healthcare costs, which it was felt could adversely affect the financial competitiveness of OECD countries. The ambition, the ambition was to cut costs and to open up new markets and investment opportunities for corporations. 
and so ensure the continued growth of global capital. What could be more reliable than investing in services that we all need and partnering with established state funded services and infrastructures and getting access to those perfectly wonderful NHS databases. According to the Transnational Institute, our initiative is classified as a project based multi stakeholderism version one for delivering projects that gain political leverage over a national geographic area or a national policy area using what are often called public private partnerships. This current loosening of data protections can be seen as part of a further development of the wave of privatization that has swept across the world since the 1970s. The privatization of water, education and healthcare in many of the countries that once provided them as public goods has dramatically changed how capitalism works, for example, creating all manner of new markets. The privatization of state enterprises almost invariably at a price that has allowed capitalists rapidly to gain immense profit has also relinquished public control over growth and investment decisions. The result has been a taking away of assets and rights from the common people. And at the same time, there are immense concentrations of wealth occurring at the other end of the scale. Accumulation by dispossession is ongoing and in recent times, has been revived as an increasingly significant element in the way global capitalism is working to consolidate corporate, corporate power. It encompasses everything from the removal of rights of access to land and livelihoods to the retrenchment of rights to pensions, education and health care. And now they wish to take control of and commodify our personal health data. Despite the independently established fact that over the years, the NHS, even with chronic underfunding, has managed to perform very well compared to its peers and has always been the service least burdened by administration. Now, with services stretched to breaking point and public opinion fueled by misinformation, we find ourselves in England, close to the completion of 42 or so, of the American style accountable care systems, which become legal entities early next year, unless 100 or so MPs have drastic changes of mind. These systems need to extract, extract granular personal data for use in artificial intelligence and other analytics simply in order to function. And as well as health and social care data, there is an opportunity to access voluntary community and social enterprise data including qualitative records. I have to admit that I felt a little bit sick when I read about this, something about the state actually coming into our homes and, and taking away things that we say. If our personal health data is valuable, as valuable as striking oil, then these systems are 42 oil rigs. They're already dependent on private corporations. 200 mainly private companies including 30 US corporations are listed as accredited on the government's health services support framework. And the depth and breadth of their involvement is staggering. Nearly all of the 12 or so work streams deal with our personal data and the bigger corporations have multiple contracts. As the long-term plan makes clear, one of the priorities driving the digitalization of the NHS is to encourage a world leading health IT industry in England with a supportive environment for software developers and innovators. In other words, NHS data is being transformed from a resource for public good into a source of private profit. The long term plan also talks about the protection of patients privacy and patients control over their data as a key priority. However, this claim has been undermined by a couple of brazen attempts to obtain data from patients' records, first through the Care Data Initiative in 2016, and this year with the GP data grab. Also, NHS Digital already has a checkered history in releasing information about patients. Clearly, patient data released under strict regulations is invaluable for academic research, service planning, and policy making making. But since 2016, over 40 companies from pharmaceutical corporations to global management consultancies, for example, AstraZeneca and McKinsey, have had access to years of sensitive medical records. And a look at just one month's figures from NHS data's 
uh, Digital's data release register shows that in 88% of cases where patient data has been released, opt-outs have been ignored. The argument in the current consultation is that the UK public will benefit from more and better use of personal data, which will deliver a stronger economy, more efficient and effective public services and greater innovation in science and technology. And the government through the changes wants us to trust these private providers, or as they are called in integrated care systems, partners with our data as we would trust the NHS. There is no doubt that there will be enormous pressures on people to share healthcare data as artificial intelligence promises wonders such as earlier diagnoses, the ability to predict disease and future dysfunction, and to be able to speed up the development of new drugs and other interventions. But what is not stated is that artificial intelligence will also help providers to ration healthcare and reduce costs by using it to develop new models of care to replace for many of us what are seen as expensive GP consultations, outpatients appointments, hospital admissions, visits to A&E, and indeed any elective contact with high-skilled, high-cost professionals. Artificial intelligence enables risk stratification to dictate the level of care patients should receive. And for many, this will mean digitally aided self-care or healthcare assistance standardized monitoring. Artificial intelligence will help integrated care systems to segment the system populations into supermarket-like surface lines, such as frail older people, people with chronic conditions or cancer survivors, including end-of-life care, and then help make the difficult decisions on how to allocate the imposed limited resource to those service lines. Using an algorithm to do this will help to reduce any moral and indeed political injury, especially when the claim is that it is moving money from low value to high value services, and so obtaining best value for each system for the money available. There is still no robust evidence in the NHS that these new models of care can improve outcomes and reduce costs. Denial or delay of care to individuals will bring huge distress, but also create markets. Um, markets for elective care and for self-care. There have already been trials of linking people's Apple, Google, or Microsoft personal health apps and other device, devices to their healthcare records. Disty Profit, chief executive of Cerner UK, hails this as the rise of the consumer in healthcare in the UK. And of course, all the data collected will be invaluable for making the most from the market. And finally, there will also be major issues when data and artificial intelligence are used for digitalization, downskilling of jobs, and the development of an agile, mobile, and performance-managed single workforce with an essential requirement to reduce costs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. So if we now move on to Phil and have his observations on this consultation. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Martin, for um, <clears throat> quite sobering talk. I would like to pick up on things from the data perspective, as Martin has mentioned, medical data has fought some of these battles already, care.data, GP data, grab earlier this year, and we continue to seek and believe that every use of patients data can be consensual, safe and transparent. But what is very clear is that these data reforms, which are coming out of DCMS uh, at the moment, the government proposals, are very much coordinated with and lined up with a number of high level strategies, as exposed in, for example, the current health and care bill, which would give powers to NHS England to be able to collect data, which, although it's been able to do so for COVID purposes during the pandemic, is new. And what we've seen with bodies like NHS England using data is they feed it to people like Palantir, uh, to do various things. So we need to see this in the framing of these are some proposals. They are very specific. They may seem dry, even boring to people who aren't really into sort of data protection, um, detail of law and what have you. But it is really clear that this is a concerted effort by a government that has an economic post-Brexit free market, you know, free trade vision of a life sciences economy that is driven by our data. 
And at the first instance and around the world, not just in the UK, it is the case that the most valuable data is your health data. It's what everyone's coming for. Yeah? If you start to look at things through that lens, then a lot of what Martin has been saying and what a lot of, I'm sure all of us are, are aware is going on around, uh, in and around the NHS make a lot of sense. Yeah, that's data perspective. You may have seen reports. I think there was one by an outfit called Tigger a, a, a while back. Um, you know, a horrible thing. And then there was a, you know, a strategy came out from a body called NHS X. I mean, it's not even a proper NHS body. It's just a, a working agreement between the Department of Health and, and NHS England. But in all of this, buried in the fine detail, the boring stuff that Jim and Mariano and myself and others go through with a fine tooth comb is a plan to you know, claw away at your rights. Those things that protect not just you, but your data, not just you, but your family, not just you know, health, but all aspects of your life. And to try to create a new regime, which rather than providing these general data protection rights, which apply very, very strongly to data, uh, what's called special category, what used to be called sensitive personal data about you, which is your, your health data, uh, a, lot, a lot of that. Instead of sort of keeping these sort of one rights, one set of rights regimes and one set of obligations for every data user, it's being broken down into special rules, special cases. And when you look at what those special cases are, and I want to go into one specific, uh, just to give you an illustration, you see that these special sort of carve outs are the very thing that we've caught companies at over the last years doing, which have been illegal. The specific example I'm gonna use is something called legitimate interests. Sounds pretty boring, but Basically, this is the bit of the law that says, OK, it is in the legitimate interest of a company or authority to be able to do something with your data. OK, and that they don't have to make other checks if it's written down, as the government proposes to do, it's automatically get out a jail Cree card. This is a legitimate interest. You can do it. OK, well, let's look at the list that's in this proposal and buried down at item H is a clause that we've seen before. We've seen it, Google putting that clause or a version of it into its, its deal with uh, the, the, the second largest hospital provider in, in, in America called Ascension. Yeah, we've seen in this country, Google deep mind, you know, essentially exploit this approach with the data it got from the Royal Free. It was found to have broken the law not once, but four times when it did that with 1.6 million patients data. And that is that once the data is flowing through an IT system provided by anyone, doesn't have to be Google, could be any, any commercial provider, it is considered to be a legitimate interest to use that data to improve the service that you are providing to the customer. What does that mean? In practice, it means you get people's medical records flowing through the systems for maybe you know, genuine administrative, even you know, care purposes. But the secondary use of that is let's train up AIs and you know, diagnostic assistants and all these other things, these great things that you know, the, the billion dollar company sort of making AI uh, uh, unicorn people talk about, but they're doing it with our data. Yeah. Now we see this happening at all levels of the NHS. It's not just the big, huge stuff. Well, I think Martin's absolutely correct to point to the, 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 you know, the, 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 the legalization of the ICS, the integrated care system, these 42 accountable care organizations, but it's happening at your GP practice as well. And increasingly we've seen this through COVID, people using an app to access GP services. But look around that, you know, we have a principle in the NHS that you cannot market patients. We fought many battles over this over the years, caught some people out, you know, doing really dodgy, dodgy stuff with uh, data from their pharmacies. Yeah, but right now 
you use some of these apps, patient access has a marketplace of paid tests and treatment wrapped around the thing that you use to access GP appointments or make your repeat prescriptions. Another one, Evergreen Life. It, you know, until very recently was upselling 125 pound DNA tests for skincare and dietary advice. You know, is this the NHS that we want to see? And if it isn't, then what is the detail that we are going to have to get into? Yeah, those clauses, like the one I just mentioned about legitimate interests, which are the loopholes that will allow this stuff to happen. I genuinely believe we have a monster fight on our hands, not just about these proposals, but in the health and care bill and various other strategies that are going on at the moment. I believe we need to educate ourselves and talk you know, across organisations, across uh, sectors. You know, data is clearly key here, but what we are all trying to protect is our national health service. And if I could, because this stuff can get quite relentless, I would like to paint a, a glimmer of positive hope. Yeah? When we do win these battles, sometimes we stop stuff. Yeah? That sale of data which Martin referred to, yeah, we may well have actually prevented NHS Digital and all the data in future goes into what's called a trusted research environment and we can see who comes to do what and what value and benefit we get from it come back to the NHS. This is not a already lost battle. It's bloody hard, really hard work, just keeping on top of all the changes that are going on. But if we work together, we in help inform each other's sort of battles and fights along the way because you know there'll be i mean I don't know, we've got the, the this consultation closes later this month but yeah you know, we've got pieces of legislation already in parliament and you know likely out of a consultation there'll be even more you know legislation coming i think we yeah you know, i hope that this webinar is is a chance for us to start talking together amongst ourselves and find the ways that we can get in to where we're going to be most effective. Anyway, I'll leave it. Um, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Phil. And Phil's wrote, wrote uh, some more on this in byline time. So we've just posted that link um, in the chat if people want to read that. So next up, uh, ask Mariano to speak a little bit about the specifics in this proposal. Um, not for too many details, but um, some of the more important ones for health. Um, I guess we'll probably talk a little bit about the research clauses as well, um, because there, as, as Phil was mentioning, there are a number of provisions in this uh, in this um, proposal which do look like they are just attempting to make legal things which were found to be unlawful. And um, Google's uh, DeepMind project is is definitely one of those in a number of instances. And uh, we have a blog detailing some of that from Mariano. So I'll dig the link out of that while he uh, chats about this in more detail. So thank you, Mariano. Thank you and good evening. Well, uh, I mean, having heard so many concerns before, I think it's a bit useful to uh, give a bit introduction, uh, a bit of an introduction of uh, how data protection interacts with these concerns and eventually how uh, the government proposal would uh, undermine the protections which are afforded by the law today. Starting from the beginning, data protection basically aims to give uh, individuals two things. The first one is control over how data is collected, disclosed and used by third parties. And the second one is uh, protection from uses of data that could be uh, discriminatory against you, always by third parties, or otherwise uh, harmful for uh, uh, either because it's harmful for uh, your health, for uh, your rights, or even for your dignity, or uh, let's say human be as a human being. Uh, the way the GDPR tries to, uh, the GDPR, which is the law that we have in place today, tries to uh, achieve this is by uh, providing on the one end obligations for those third parties. So basically for who uses the data uh, about you in order not to harm you and to do uh, use this data in a, in a manner which is transparent, which is fair and to consider your interest in the equation. 
The second one is by empowering you with rights to ask questions, to uh, object or contest what somebody's doing with the information that they have about you. And then third one is to give you access to remedies in case that, uh, I mean, basically you are victim of an abuse and therefore you need to uh, put an end to it. Uh, so having uh, given this introduction, let's say, uh, the government is fundamentally uh, aiming to undermine both of these three pillars of data protection, if we want. Uh, I think it's useful to start from the last two ones, which is uh, uh, the rights and the uh, remedies, because uh, uh, we can uh, summarize them in a more general way. And, there, and, then, and afterwards, we can go to the obligations part, which is where the research proposals are and where probably the Jewish for uh, the sake of this conversation, conversation lies. First one is, uh, so there are three main rights that uh, are going to be affected by government proposal, which is the right to a human review, the right to uh, right of access, and the right to lodge a complaint to the supervisor authority. The right of human review is the right to uh, basically not be subjected to a solely automated decision. The government is uh, consulting with the idea of uh, uh, scrapping this right and to basically allow other organizations to take uh, decisions about you in a black box, even if these have life-changing uh, consequences against you. The second one is um, uh, the right of access. This is one of the most important rights given by uh, data protection exactly because it allows you to ask questions to who has your data about what data they have, what they're doing with this. And so it's fundamentally an uh, important leverage for transparency and for exposing and challenging the uh, uh, abuses of data. In this sense, the government is looking forward to introduce nominal fees, so basically to make it expensive for you to uh, exercise this right on the one end, and on the other hand, they want to empower organizations, or by the way, the recipient of this request, to reject your request of access to uh, your own data for uh, a number of reasons, let's say. And the final one is uh, uh, the right to log lodge a complaint that will become more bureaucratic and basically uh, you will be asked to do a sort of a small pre-action protocol against the offender that you want to bring in front of an authority before actually bringing it in front of an authority. Um, here there is an important change of perspective that is the bottom line of uh, uh, this story, which is what before used to be uh, meant to exactly give you the right to know, now is seen as a, a procedural hurdle that wants to protect the organization who is using the data against your willingness to know what's going on and against the objection, objections you would like to uh, raise. Second aspect goes into the remedies. Here, uh, there are two main aspects where this uh, proposal will have an impact on the GDPR. The first one is the independency of independent, uh, yes, the independent role of the uh, ICO, so the watchdog. Here, the government wants to have uh, the power to amend the salary of the commissioner without parliamentary scrutiny. So fundamentally, they want a stick to use if the commissioner puts their, uh, their nose in uh, somewhere where the government doesn't want them to look at. And just because they want to make it formal, they also want the power to dictate the priorities of the ICO with an annual, annual statement. Uh, on the other hand, the GDPR didn't only provide for an independent supervisor authority to basically uh, address these concerns, but also for accountability rules and for, um, let's say, basically, um, for, well, let's start from the accountability rules. Uh, the government is fundamentally looking forward to uh, allow organization not to retain most of the records or of the documents that they had to do before in order to process your data, as well as the assessment of whether this data would be harmful or not. And also the government is looking forward to uh, asking, uh, and here there is a bit the connection between, uh, um, let's say, what happens in uh, foreign uh, organizations and what happens for the independent regulator to ask the ICO to consider the economic, I mean, basically the interest of growth and innovation of the uh, organizations who are using this data when uh, the ICO exercises their function and basically uh, enforces the law in order to uphold your rights. 
the bottom line of this, and this is useful to go into the next section, is that, that, is that for instance, in the uh, consultation that the CMS has brought, uh, has brought forward, one of the examples that they do about how data can be an incredibly innovative uh, mean for uh, promoting the public good and so forth is exactly the Google DeepMind case. And the Google, uh, in Google DeepMind, we exactly had the regulator that went uh, in, and basically scrutinized the uh, contract that was made by, between the NHS Free Trust and Google DeepMind. Uh, they found a lot of irregularities and eventually they started to order uh, the rectification of the uh, use of personal data that was done in this uh, sector. And this is an, a perfect example of how uh, putting a burden on the ICO to basically uh, promote innovation while upholding your right could mean that they have to choose either to stop DeepMind doing this or because the government believes that this is innovative, allowing this to go further. Going, to, uh, going into what instead is the first pillar of the GDPR has we let's say, uh, artificially uh, divided the GDPR for the sake of the discussion, which is the obligations. Here, um, let's say, something that was mentioned before by Phil uh, goes basically into uh, one of the most fundamental safeguards of data protection, which is the idea of proposed limitation and legality. This spurs basically from the idea that uh, when you disclose data to someone, uh, your expectations and generally speaking, your ability to control how this data is used is determined by the information that you're given, but most importantly, by the context in which you're doing this. So for instance, uh, if you go in a hospital and you disclose uh, health information, you expect this data to be used to uh, provide you assistance and not to be sold to uh, health insurance companies for you know, their own direct marketing purposes. This is one of the examples that could be applied in this case. And here, uh, let's say one uh, very important provision that the government is putting forward is about uh, the possibility to basically uh, break this proposed limitation principle for reason of substantial public interest. Now, why is this important? Because when they do this, they uh, mention in particular the case of the COVID response to coronavirus. And here comes into play all the uh, programs that were launched at the time to kind of um, uh, take the health data from different providers and try to collate them together and to use them to gather a picture of uh, how the pandemic was evolving and uh, drawing a response from them from there in order to uh, counter the pandemic. It is also relevant because most of the uh, programs that the government ran at the time were actually in breach of the law and they had a very, uh, let's say, uh, material consequences such as uh, health information or contact tracing information of individuals be shared on social media or being used by bar staff to harass women uh, from uh, uh, contact data and stuff like that. And there it shows exactly how, uh, let's say, the willingness of the government to basically uh, take away the safeguards that the GDPR today uh, builds around the uh, uh, the, I mean, basically, the GDPR, yes, for reasons of public interest, allows to break the group limitation principle, but provided that there are very strong safeguards in place in order to prevent abuses of, uh, uh, about how this data is being used for this purpose. And uh, the government is, pro is uh, basically looking forward to uh, take away those safeguards so that there can be a more liberal use of information when it comes to the public interest. And finally, uh, we go to the research proposals. Why is this important? Because here, uh, in particular, we have uh, two or three main uh, proposals. First one is, so, okay, first a, gen a general consideration is the uh, framework for research proposals in the GDPR is already exceptional, meaning that it's already a, a breach of the rule of proposed limitation. It's the idea that, okay, you have data which is, uh, has been collected for a reason, now it can be used for another reason, which is research. And of course, the bottom line of that is that research is something that has a, a societal value and something that has been done in a ethical way and so forth. And therefore, uh, if it is done correctly, this should be allowed. 
point is exactly uh, so this is exactly uh, where the government proposal comes into play and kind of uh, shuffles these things a bit. First of all, uh, they are proposing to change the definition of what scientific resource, uh, research mean. And in doing this, they're also asking for additional or supplementary ways of defining what scientific research is. Now, uh, something interesting is that there has been a roundtable convened by the uh, Open Data Institute from people who actually use data for the public interest, and none of them actually expressed the same concern that the government has about uh, uh, what scientific research means. And therefore, uh, it is difficult to understand on the one way why the government is so obsessed with changing the definition of scientific research. On the other hand, the fact that they want to expand it may, uh, and also the examples that they give in the consultation, suggest that they might want to introduce things such as market researchers as the development of artificial intelligence intelligence among the re among the definition of scientific research. And we heard before why this would be problematic. Second aspect is uh, they want to create a, a legal ground which is specifically designed for research. Here, the bottom line is that uh, today I'm, today's uh, legal grounds are already providing avenues that researchers can use in order to basically uh, use your data in a ethical way and uh, do their own things. And introducing a new uh, legal ground brings the risk that this legal ground won't have the safeguards and won't have the balance that was enshrined in the current provisions and therefore for instance, not allowing individuals to opt out of a research or opt in when it is the case, or uh, it will allow, it could allow uh, research for reasons which are not in the public interest or which uh, are not, let's say, done as a task with a, a public uh, proposal, stuff like that. The uh, final consideration, which I guess it's useful in this sense is there is also a, a, another proposal where the government would like to make it easier for researchers to uh, rely on a, an, an exception to the uh, principle of uh, transparency in the GDPR. And uh, I mean, again, uh, there are, but I mean, basically none of the stakeholders that so far have spoken really expressed any concern about uh, the ability to rely on this uh, exemption when it is uh, necessary. But the point is exactly uh, why is the government so interested to make research not transparent? So why is it the government trying to make it possible for organization to conduct research without informing you or without notifying you and so forth? Um, uh, yes, I mean, like, uh, so this is, uh, I guess, the picture that comes out of uh, this consultation. And if you start to collate it together, you realize that on the one end, where uh, the GDPR used to give obligations and limits and boundaries over how and basically protection for you, uh, those limits and boundaries uh, have, and protection have been watered down significantly. On the other hand, where the GDPR used to empower you, this proposal will disempower you greatly. And finally, where the GDPR used to give you access to remedies and independent oversight, independent oversight wouldn't be so much independent anymore and access to remedies would be more difficult. So this is a bit the future that we are fighting against. Thank you very much, Mariano. So I think what we're saying here then is from, from Martin and Phil, there's a big commercial imperative. The government has been planning and pushing in this kind of direction for a long time. Data is, health data is the big asset that they want to tackle, or one of the big assets they really want to monetize. And what we've heard from Mariano is that they're trying to produce lots of loopholes and new legal bases to use that data uh, in ways that are currently unlawful and primarily for commercial benefit, not for public research benefits, which already permitted, but essentially commercial research purposes, which appear designed, you know, to, to enable this, this kind of uh, monetary land grab uh, of, of health data, personal data. So uh, quick comment from Phil there. 
just a very quick one. Yes, that, but also planning. Um, the, the GP data to grab was GP data for planning and research. I absolutely agree with what Mariano said and what you've just said and the commercial imperatives. But one of the reasons why, to pick up on Mariano's point about transparency, why the government doesn't want to be so transparent about what it calls research is planning, which is what also Martin referred to how it decides to ration services, to risk stratify. All of these functions that it does, either within the NHS or increasingly across government departments, can roughly be wrapped up into this notion of planning. And while there are economic interests in play there, I don't think they're quite the same as private commercial interests. It's how they want to run the whole system. Sorry, just wanted to sort of put in that little bit of balance because sometimes as Mariana says the changes don't make sense unless you count in the fact that the government wants to do a bunch of stuff itself yeah give itself a get out of jail free card not just give companies and, and others yeah I completely agree the government is um I know less about the health section but um for, for cert the government is trying to give itself a number of free passes as, as Mariana was outlining, is the public purposes, uh, the list of public purposes is designed to essentially allow the government to say, regarding any kind of data that it has, if we say we want to have a public purpose and we stick it in this list, no safeguards um, need apply now. So if they put in, for instance, that uh, uh, data should be used for immigration checks that's a public purpose uh, that we we just want then it would be possible to just use that loophole and we wouldn't have to consider whether using that data whatever the source uh excuse me if i'm oversimplifying mariano but that would then lead to kind of uh, that you could use that data without considering the impacts of you of that on for instance people who would feel excluded from the health system or excluded from the education system because that data was now being used essentially to chase people uh, rightly or wrongly. And you wouldn't necessarily have to consider the fact about that the problem that, that some of these people might be wrongly chased. All those things, considerations would just be irrelevant from a data perspective, um, protection perspective. Um, I'd really like to invite questions now. We've got quite a few people uh, listening in um, to this, this chat. And I, I would really like to see what people think about these. Are you worried? Uh, are you intending to respond? Does it sound too complicated? Um, because I want to, would like to get a sense of where people's thinking is and then also then help people through some of those, those tricky issues. And um, obviously I'll be able to ask the panelists a few questions and dive down into some of these things a bit more. Um, but uh, it'd be great to see some, some questions from uh, the audience as well and um, while while people think of things to um, to ask I think I'll just ask all the panelists um, how do you feel this this consultation uh, will be received do you think the government will uh, feel surprised by the feedback they get do you expect them to ignore the feedback they get how, because it 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 feels very much like this was a quite a poorly you know, bluntly quite a poorly designed uh response uh, consultation i should say um we hit about the tigger report the tigger report was an extraordinarily poor piece of work uh you know really bad uh yet it's been taken as extremely credible um by the government and bits of that were in this consultation document about where, what we should water down and how much uh GDPR was burdensome and what should be gotten rid of. Um, the justifications within the document itself are also pretty poor. Often the examples they cite are things which are already perfectly legal. Um, so how do how do the panelists feel this is the, 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 what do they think is going to happen after they get a uh, you know obviously they'll get some positivity from some parts of the industry. Uh, I think they will get quite a lot of negativity from other places. What do you think? How do you think they will uh, deal with that? Who wants to go first? Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, they say that uh, we should learn from history, 
and KOMP sent in something like 5,000 submissions, not all the same. We made sure that they weren't the same and they didn't all say they were from KOMP to when NHS England wanted to say the, the legal changes that they wanted to make and which went into the, um, the health and care bill. And they, they just dropped, I think nearly 5,000 <laughs> submissions, which is an amazing thing to do. But, but because they, they saw us as being in some way, you know, organizing together and, 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 and not, <sighs> Not talking, you know, we were talking about privatization and, and the way that they were going to use those changes rather than the technical bits. Um, so I, I'm a I'm a little bit skeptical that that that, that they genuinely want to listen. They, they will listen to the bits that that they receive that they want to, is my experience. I'm sorry to say that. Yeah. Oh. I, I think Martin's correct, but I'm not I'm not gonna be a prophet of doom. Um, I, I think uh, is it Graham Cobb has asked about focusing one's responses. The fact is, this is a giant mess, as, as, as Jim has said. There are things to me, looking at this when I first read it, I'm just going, uh, that, that's just complete rubbish. Um, maybe they're even floating a few balloons to be popped in this stage so they can actually bring through what looks like a more measured set of proposals and you know, they're willing to sacrifice some stuff at the edges. I think what we must do is to focus um, or, or, or work out how or what we care about to focus on. Roughly with you know, Mariano's three pillars, I think is a good high level approach. Um, you know, are you more concerned about you know, things that individuals you know, rights you know, protecting rights, or are we more concerned about putting obligations onto data users, data controllers, companies, government even? Yeah. So at that high level, I think, you know, um, it would be good to have a range of responses that way. And that's worked for us also. We've had um, many cases over the years. I've been campaigning in and around data stuff for the you know, best part of two decades now. And the number of times they just ignore what they say are coordinated responses. Um, but what they do do, and what I think is going to happen in the process, and please correct me if you think this is wrong, Mariano or, or Jim, but because we're in a consultation process and that we're moving towards a bill, there are going to be a number of opportunities for you know, evidence with a bit more impact to be given. Yeah? If I'm an organisation, I'd be putting a response into this consultation now, not so much as I'm going to you know, get them to listen to me now as a stake in the ground for the ongoing process, maybe even giving evidence to Parliament. You know, this has happened, I'm sure, you know, Jim and Mariano and myself have given evidence to Parliament many times in the process of, you know, bill formation or even, you know, uh, select committees looking at uh, uh, proposals and what have you. So I'd see it as part of a process and as disappointing as it can be to have a poor response from government. I think we have to prepare ourselves for that almost certainty. I would honestly think this is so poor. I think they're going to have to do it again. I, I, I can't see how they can go from this to a bill. Not least because, and this is where we're very, you know, we have to be really quite close to some of the sectors here and, and research funders know what that they are proposing, what the government is proposing is nuts for them yeah they've had care.data they've had gpdpr the scientific research funders the people at huge things like mrc and welcome and what have you the ones that, that that put a lot of money into into actual scientific research know that when you mix that up or blur the lines with industrial development or commercial exploitation they're the ones that suffer so I think we may actually have an opportunity, maybe not in the consultation itself, but as I say, this talking across sectors and groups and aligning our interests, that's what I'd be looking for out of this process rather than, yeah, we, we, you know, we set this whole consultation on fire with a bunch of written responses, which I think is not really likely. Mariano. Yes, so 
uh, and first of all, speaking about uh, government intention, I have no doubt that they are in bad faith, meaning that uh, this is also something that they just read in the uh, chat. And yes, I mean, it's true, as I was saying, that most of these proposals are steamrolling uh, everything that the GDPR stood for. But it's also true that you can look at it from the perspective that the government is fundamentally scrapping every obligation and every uh, accountability requirements that they breached in the past or was used to hold them to account. So they're not shooting in the gut, in the dark. I mean, it's kind of a, they're systematically trying to dismantle everything that stood in their way to do whatever they were doing. Um, speaking about um, how to counter this, let's say something that you notice from the consultation, however, is that uh, they're trying to do this in a way that, I mean, they probably consider to be intelligent in terms of they try not to show this intention and they try to, let's say, uh, present things in a misguided or confusionary way so that you don't understand what's behind. And generally speaking, uh, uh, even in some uh, occasions where we actually interacted with the uh, civil servants from the uh, digital, uh, I mean, from the Ministry of Digital, by the way, every time you were kind of exposing what's behind this. Uh, uh, proposals, they were always uh, starting to push back by saying this is not what we mean and so forth. So my guess here is that uh, the most important thing right now is to uh, show opposition to what they're doing because exactly they're trying to uh, bring a different picture, a different I mean, like they're trying to depict what they're doing in a different way. Even if you think at the very beginning when the proposal was presented, I mean, literally, this CMS was uh, posting on uh, Instagram pictures of, you know, like we are raising fines for uh, telemarketing. So this is the way they presented this proposal. And then you read it and it's absolutely about uh, everything else but telemarketing, which is never mentioned, by the way. So yes, I would say exposing them and showing opposition, possibly answering to the consultation by showing disagreement with what they're doing is probably uh, one of the useful way that can be done right now in order to uh, show the government that people are actually noticing what's going on. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think it, sorry, I'll come back to you a sec, Phil. I, I, I mean, I think it's um, absolutely right for people to respond because that is a challenging thing. So we've tried to make that that easy, right? So at uh, at our, at our URL, if you go to that, um, so openrightsgroups.org forward slash stop data discrimination, um, we can follow the link in the chat. Uh, we have there a, consulta a consultation response, bubble response that Mariana wrote. I mean, for each of the main questions, uh, it goes into some detail. So if you are willing to spend, you know, half an hour, an hour, going through some of that, thinking about these answers, you can do it that way. Um, over the next week or so, we'll also make a very simple kind of, here's five things to say page, which will be again, just kind of taking those three pillars that Mariana was talking about and giving some general points to, to, to respond to this in an extremely quick way. So we'll make sure everyone can do both of those. Um, what this chat today, we were really hoping to find people within the health sector who were thinking about uh, health campaigners uh, who are thinking about responding or uh, worried about the direction of, of, of this of this consultation and, and the way that health has been used to try to encourage you to respond because I think it's important that the government hears opposition from a range of uh, places if it, even if it, does, it won't stop anything but it'll certainly slow them up because they will have to start thinking, you know, is this true? What do we do about it? Could this become a political problem? When is it going to become a political problem? And I think it can also embolden the opposition parties as well. And probably the biggest thing we've got to do is to make this a political issue because the government will try to present this as technical, boring, uh, stuff that only geeks and lawyers get involved in. And, and if, if it stays in that place, then they'll get away with whatever they like um you know the only people who try to help them to account are going to be uh probably external to the uk uh, but it but it won't be uh you know if it stays in that place it won't be parliament um i'll stop there there are, there are some also some other considerations about what the process they might use as well but i i do, I do want to give the panel the majority of the time here so phil do, do you have some extra things to say i think 
Yes, just I'm just noticing a number of people saying what can we do individually and also mentioning about uh, human rights. So what, one thing I would say, and this is from, again, my long term experience with Noto ID as well, is that while there's a consultation going in government, hopefully we've got across that this is a big picture thing. And one thing that you can really do, usefully do as an individual is to, even if you hate their guts and you think they hate you, um, to actually make the point to your MP yeah, about one, in this first instance, one or a small handful of the rights that are going to be taken away from you. If you get an MP who is going to speak in the House about this, that they've got constituents telling them, I care about, you know, you're going to charge me to see my own data? That's insane. You can have a really quite straightforward, this is just wrong and unfair type approach to an MP that then provides fuel for the battle later. I'm sorry if that sounds a little bit abstract, but I, I promise you, it, this is how things actually work. When MPs can stand up knowing that they've got constituents who have written to them and care enough about this stuff, they may well use that. I think it's picking up on things that you may already have done. I and mean, we know over a million and a half people this summer and a million and a half people in uh, 2014 opted out. Now, you exercised a right. Now, you know, that right that you've got at the moment is one that is at the behest of the Secretary of State for health at any time, but it is, or it mirrors, a GDPR right that you'd have as a backstop if, you know, the government decided to, you know, take that right away. So if you've done something already, you've cared enough to do something already, simply expressing that not just wildly firing it into a consultation, but yeah, that's fine, but expressing it directly to your representative has a cumulative effect um, and I think we all know everyone in campaigning knows this it's sort of like you know sometimes responding to the government seems like a bit of a fall line hope but over time you know actually getting it through the the heads of the representatives can be a useful thing and someone mentioned uh, I can't remember if it's Rob or someone about the Human Rights Act yes so this is a battleground that we are fighting around our rights now and you can well believe that if they manage to get away with stuff with your data related rights, they are almost certainly coming for further human rights. So, as I say, a bit of a long battle ahead, but I think together and by you know, aligning our interests and finding ways to align you know, interests, like I said, with research and you know, data, we actually may have a chance which, is, as, as Jim says, looks a little bit forlorn in, in Parliament at, uh, at the present time. Yeah, I think they will, if, if, it, if it's understood that data protection uh, reforms are going to challenge people's relationship with the NHS and worry people about, you know, make people worried about the future of their health data, that's the kind of thing that where, where politicians will start to uh, understand that this is problematic. There are other areas like this too, uh, employment data, for instance, uh, you know, your employers being able to hire and fire you on the basis of what the machine does. I mean, that's where this, these rules are going. Um, so there are plenty of areas where where the parliamentarians can get concerned. Um, Benefits and welfare, Jim, as well. That's one really important one. We can talk about immigration and employment, but but you know, DWP is actively commissioning a, a shadow health record right now. Yeah, so we really need to sort of look at this. This isn't just them coming for those distant people over there. That is coming, it's coming closer and closer to the heart of all of us. Yeah, thank you, Phil. So um, a couple of other bits. Uh, people have asked a little bit about what they should do in terms of putting in a response and what the main points should be. Um, what And also, does it have to um, follow the questions? Um, Mariano, can you give us a quick overview of those points? So speaking about uh, uh, whether this, um, the answer to this consultation has to follow government structure or not, uh, the government, I think, provides two different ways for answering. One is an online questionnaire, which I don't advise to you, but it's kind of, of course, if you choose this option, the, uh, the answer will be organized in the way they actually uh, organize the consultation itself. The other one is by sending in a response by email to uh, an email that they do provide uh, uh, in the website and that we also provide in our website. 
And this, of course, gives you more, uh, let's say, liberty in terms of framing the argument, etc. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, uh, ideally, you still would like to follow their structure just because this way you kind of record the fact that there was strong disagreement about this proposal, and strong disagreement about this other proposal, and so forth. But of course, uh, uh, um, let's say an answer to this consultation is better than no answer to this consultation at all. It's kind of, uh, uh, if you have to choose between following the structure or not, I would say uh, I like a go the, the way that uh, uh, you're allowed to. I, I mean that it's feasible for you. And finally, speaking about uh, uh, the way we organize the information on our web website and that you can use. Yes, they uh, broadly follow the uh, division that I was making at the beginning of the uh, of my talk. So like uh, obliga obligation, so basically the right to data protection, the uh, right for individuals and the remedies for uh, individuals as well. Uh, each section has uh, its own set of problems and for each problem there is like a, a very high level presentation of how this impacts on uh, uh, your rights and has the potential to discriminate or to harm you. And then for uh, each of these sections, apart from this kind of a general presentation, there is a link to our draft uh, response, which is something that you can uh, I either decide to uh, use and expand on your own, or you can simply use as a template for uh, understanding a bit what is it that this uh, proposal is talking about and eventually expressing your opinion about it. So, uh, yeah, this is pretty much uh, uh, what we prepare. Thank you, Mariano. Um, can I ask Martin, what, what do you feel you're going to concentrate on in the, uh, in the consultation response? Uh, I, I, I haven't really thought about that. I, what I was wanting to say was something a bit more positive to the, the negative things I have been talking about. And that is that the, the Lancet Financial Times submission is now out. It came out last week. And it, 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 you know, I think it's a very powerful document that goes through all the negative things that could potentially happen, but also explores the alternative provision that's happening elsewhere in the world, even, even as we speak. For instance, the, the public data trust that's being set up in Sweden, where electronic health records allows citizens to view their medical data and see who has accessed it on national electronic health records. And the idea of data research trusts and public benefit data trusts. And this whole emphasis to separate what's in the public interest from what's in the private interest and to bring everything back into some sort of solidarity framework is the, is the whole push of that uh, paper. And um, I, I, you know, I think that that is going to affect the medical profession now that that's out. It's there and it's, it's a good framework, but it's how we get that uh, you know, to the general public, you know, it, it's, it's it's a long read, and that has the, the messages from that have got to be um, communicated about other ways. You know, the, the government will probably say this is the, this is the only way, this is the best way. Working with private uh, enterprise is the way that we beat COVID. All this nonsense that, that they have, but we have to show that there is an alternative that is fairer for everyone. Thank you. So that sounds a really that interesting. Come into this, that won't come into this this consultation, though. And I, I think I still have to think about the responses that I'm going. Well, KOMP. I will be working with KOMP on this. It might do, Martin. We 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 did a piece on the precisely on this, looking at the German uh, railways and automation and what you could do in the NHS. Essentially, for a smaller amount of money than is being currently spent on the AI lab, which has done fuck all during pandemic. Um, you could train up uh, postdocs in each of the NHS's 100 plus clinical specialisms and keeping the, our data inside the NHS, we could get the initial intellectual property. I discover what is going to be useful clinically to us in the NHS. And because we've got those algorithms, we can then do what the NHS has always done is 
you know, give it away to the world for free. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, there is a message here of a different vision. And I 100% I with 1000% agree with Martin here. It is not just arguing against something, it is arguing for something. But the precursors or the prerequisites for that something is it, there is, it respects people's rights. And it puts you know, real obligations on you know, and, and rules that everyone must follow, a clear set of rules. And we don't have what this government is clearly doing, which is cutting stuff up for their cronies and what have you. But yeah, that argument I've just said, a bit annoyed at myself for saying it, is, is something that's only going to convince people who believe what you already believe. Yeah. The argument that they won't have heard about, we could actually train up all the F2s who are dropping out of the NHS. Yeah, and actually have new career pathways, you know, profound, you know, long term impact on healthcare not being done by outsourcing everything to Google and Amazon and, 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 what, and what have you and, and, and just kowtowing to Silicon Valley. But we could actually do it with the NHS, create new career pathways. You know, it's all not just high level AI stuff, you know, there's data, jobs all the way up the, all, all the, way up the chain. Yeah, we need to be thinking about a future where data is going to be a part of the future for the country, for the NHS, no matter what. We just need to think about a diff different and better ways of doing it and explain that to the public. Sorry, that was a bit of a passionate ramble, but I've, mm. you know, I, I, you know, we've had that idea to try to get to boil it down to people. There's a choice here. Billions to Google, Palantir or, and everyone else, or a quarter of a billion of the order of what we've already spent and got nothing for, and we could have something majestic. Thank you, Phil. I, I think that's very interesting. I think the point about uh, the intellectual property that's generated is quite an important one as well. Um, in that, as you were saying, the, these proposals are designed to create assets for private companies who will then utilize it for private profit but of course that has a limited relatively speaking impact on the world because only those who are prepared to pay those fees to that company can use those assets and they may indeed not wish all of those assets to be released outside of their own company if it's kind of assets for you know algorithms for discerning certain sorts of tree treatment or doing triage or whatever it happens to be so in some ways, uh, the, the, the benefits are automatically much less if they are in private hands uh, from that kind of research. So the more fundamental research is, the more generic it is, the worse an idea it is for that to be led by the private sector if what you're actually after is uh, global health benefits. And of course, you, you kind of see a particular example of that in this pandemic around uh, the the the, the, the big arguments have been having around what what the right way to license drugs is and what kind of patents should and shouldn't be allowed around those and um, there's precisely those sort of arguments in a particular context but but you know this obviously is a much more generic and uh, broader kind of approach i had a specific question which i think i'd like you to ask uh, answer phil which is about the um shadow health records and somebody's asked given the grotesque number of austerity deaths and disproportionate number of dis disabled people during the pandemic uh, dying and the contempt for the disabled, um, this is a very unsurprising and frightening, um, the more so uh, given the indifference to, of many people to the deaths of disabled elderly and vulnerable people. So, yeah, I think I think um, that's asking about a little bit more to know a little bit more about the DWP's plans for uh, or, or operationalizing these shadow health records, what they consist of and how they'll be used. And then perhaps we can, Mariana, you might give some thoughts about what the data protection requirements around that ought to be uh, in the current regime, because I can imagine those could be open to legal challenge uh, in the current framework, but probably less so in the future one that's being proposed here. Just start with you, Phil. Yes, so I mean, this is a, a long term ambition. You know, parts of government have wanted to um, you know, break down the barriers to data sharing um, uh, for, for, for decades now. 
what we're seeing with DWP and health records is the DWP simply will not believe what a, your doctor tells them or it about you and wants to create another record because of that. I mean, this is the insanity that we have got to in or within government and the sort of silos that we're seeing. Yeah, because DWP doesn't trust you, it won't trust what your doctor says about you. It has to have its grubby paws on its own copy of data about you. This played out across government, not just with the shadow health record, but with you know, sharing across government, starts to speak to a very, very worrying type of future where you, know, you yourself in your life, living what we call ground truth, are exposed to what we call official truth or what is held on a government database about you. And policies will increasingly be made, discriminatory policies will increasingly be made on that official truth, yeah, the secondary or shadow record, and not what is actually going on in your life, in your care and treatment that you are receiving from the NHS. So it's a catastrophic failure of trust on the one level. It's a acquisitive power game about data and information on another. And it is, as you rightly say, Jim, one which I think, you know, elements of this, these proposals show that, you know, government just wants to give itself, you know, extra goes at your data. We, we, we call it secondary uses. Yeah, which is basically anything other than the purpose for which it was gathered in, in the first place. And while many of those secondary uses will be commercial, so will many of them be you know, from other bits of government wanting to get into aspects of your life simply because they don't trust you, they want to deny you benefits or deny you services, turn you down for this or that and the other. And we've seen this with home office and central status, we see it with DWP, you know, I'm afraid you know, we are fighting a battle here where the most valuable data is health data and the one that you know, impacts on you in your life really, really directly, but it's all across the piece. Thank you. Mariana, do you want to just give us a few thoughts about how uh, this might be balanced currently in, in data protection regime and what, where, the, where, where it might, where a legal challenge or government accountability might currently be applied? Yes, I mean, speak, uh, based on this uh, observation into what uh, Phil told, there are probably a lot of issues from the data protection perspective on this thing. I would say, generally speaking, it's really about the transparency and in a way about fairness, because, of course, uh, if you, uh, coming back to the issue of, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, your rights and generally speaking, uh, your expectation about data is being used is shaped by the context if you have your own record of health information, you probably expect the NHS to take decision about uh, your medical condition based in those records or in what the doctor is telling about you. And of course, uh, the fact that the NHS maybe takes decision about you based on a record that you don't even know it exists is fundamentally unfair and transparent. And also, uh, it is a very... Uh, stifling of your other rights under the GDPR because before we talked about the right of uh, access which is of course important as a matter of transparency but then there are also rights to uh, correct information which are wrong the rights to delete information which uh, you want to delete and so forth and of course if this is a shadow record if this is a record and you don't even know it exists all those rights uh, uh, are not within your reach and this is a problem Thank you. And because those rights are, are, are kind of potentially not properly a, accounted for at the moment, that leads the possibility of then launching legal a, a challenges to that through judicial review or, or other mechanisms. And of course, that's the thing with GDPR. It doesn't mean that everything's fine and great and no data abuse occurs. It just gives us some tools to stop it when it happens. So it's fairly natural that the government should want out of that uh, and not be questioned about it. And it's not terribly surprising that government wants uh, their favoured kind of business 
to also uh, get out of uh, that kind of responsibility. Um, but whether that's good for us in general is quite another question. Um, I think we're getting quite close to the end uh, right now. There's a few people have dropped off and uh, that's always a sign that probably people have heard most of what they need and, and are, are getting to the end of their ability to concentrate. So I suggest what we do is just have a few uh, more closing remarks from everybody um, and sort of wrap up this discussion. Um, if we start perhaps with uh, with Martin, um, just like to hear your thoughts about uh, you know where, where this goes, uh, what you'll be doing, um, and uh, yeah, what what the next steps are. Well, um, as I think Jan Jan Savage put into the chat, we will be making a, a response to uh, this. Uh, we've been helped enormously by by hearing everything that you've said, uh, you know, the uh, the whole of this is, is incredibly technical, but, it, you know, it, it's very helpful that we do work together. And this will be uh, a main part, a major part, I think, of our campaigning, because it, it, it just it just ties everything to it's like, you know, shall I say, it's like the cherry on the cake. This is this is health data is so valuable. And yes, they're, they're, they're making all the, the changes for, for other clinical reasons and to cut costs, but they get the health data as well. So it, it, it will be, it is, and will be even more perhaps now, uh, I think a major part of KOMP campaigning. That's what I'll be pushing for. Thank you, Martin. Um, Mariano. So my main takeaway is basically that uh, on the one end, yes, we heard about uh, how data can be used in a discriminatory manner, and generally speaking, there are a lot of concerns that can raise for me. Uh, something that has been mentioned before, and it's also true, is the fact that this doesn't necessarily has to be the case. I mean, there can be uses of data which are actually good for the, for the public, which are good for you and so forth. Uh, what, however, brings your interest into the equation when it comes to the use of data is exactly uh, data protection and uh, from the point of view where we stand right now, the GDPR. Um, let's say this is a bit the, the reading key that you should take when uh, you see uh, government plans to remove the GDPR or to, let's say, remove rights that are given to you today. Doing so will fundamentally mean that, yes, there will be more use of data, but this is a normal process. We live in a society which is more and more digitized and therefore uh, technology drives, let's say, information to be uh, used and uh, manipulated digitally. But whether this is done in your interest or in someone else's interest, basically depends on whether he have rights or not. Thank you, Mariana, that's very succinctly put. Um, and Phil. I just want to say thank you again to everyone here and, and to Org for, for inviting me along. My takeaway is that we do have to work on this, as Martin says, together. We will all have our own hand on you know, one or two, two parts of an elephant, but we're all absolutely uh, agreed and aware that, that, that there is an elephant here. Um, in terms of what I, I apologize, I didn't I didn't manage to put all of the links into the notes that I made for this call. Um, but what I can do is sort of send that to Jim, and hopefully you can send it when you when you're sending stuff around to people in future. So my if you like my citations, the links for what I've been saying are all things that you can refer to. Um, you know, when you, something you're particularly concerned about. You know, we've been doing this work. For a while and I, I, I got a bunch of more material that people can read and, and, and cite as uh, personally. Um, I think yeah my main takeaway is it's, you know this is this is the beginning of a really big fight going as deep as human rights certainly going across all of our data and those of you who know me uh, will know that you know, I, I often frame things in quite dramatic terms, but you know, this is the fight we cannot afford to lose. Yeah, we've won all of these rights, and it took years, decades before I came on the scene to win all of these rights. 
yeah and we know that the government is coming for them and even if what any individual one of us or our organizations do is only to just you know, do its best to make the strongest case to the people that it has the ears and influence over then that is a part of the fight yeah med confidential is a tiny organization myself and sam smith basically but when we tell people the truth when we told people the truth this summer a million and a half people opted out they just needed to know and know what to do and have the form to be able to do it so there isn't anything that you know, isn't beyond just your ability to tell your friends, tell your family, work out what your specific concerns are about this. You know, what, one thing more than another, it doesn't have to be understanding everything. It doesn't have to be knowing the detail of the law. Think about the thing that really annoys you, really feels unfair, wrong, and make that your thing you know, to take forward. And you know, with events like this, we will join up a whole bunch of people who are coming at the problem from very different angles, maybe. Um, but together, that's where I think we will have our effect. That certainly, in my experience, has been where we've had an effect. For whichever government it's been, Tory or you know, going back to the Blair Brown years, it was it was the strange bedfellows effect. Yeah, it was people across the board going, "No, this is just wrong." Yeah, that the government has to take account of. Might not want to listen. But once it spreads, you know, they have to take account. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, I heartily agree with that. This is all about everybody voicing their concerns and starting with a response, obviously, but your MPs uh, and, and absolutely pushing on this, not just during this consultation phase, but in the, in the months, years ahead. Um, Open rights groups certainly be wanting to work more with health organisations, as we, we've also been reaching out to uh, the migration sector um, and to organisations working on discrimination issues. Um, and you know there is there is very definitely a groundswell of concern. The que the question is how far we get, of course, in this phase, but then how far we need to get which is you know much much further but I, I i think the the good thing is i think people are at this point they do understand how important data is they're not familiar with all the legal frameworks and that's that that's the weak bit but they are interested to know and willing to hear in a way that perhaps 10 or 15 years ago would have been much much harder for people um and as everyone has said that's because data now is central to our lives and we need that balance in the way that policy is developed we can't have it one-sided uh, where, where that was something you could get away with 10 or 20 years ago now it just propels us into a horrendously one-sided uh, disproportionately uh, you know benefiting some very small minorities uh, of, of essentially wealthy corporations rather than uh, the, the bulk of us as a population and, and having a fairer and uh, uh, a sustainable kind of society where people you know are comfortable with private profit you know we, we all can be comfortable with private profit but it requires that to be fair and balanced and for people not to be unduly exploited and and that i think is where we can find common ground across politics on this so thank you again for everybody uh, particularly martin phil and mariano for uh, your contributions but also a very very lively chat and questions and answers from the attendees very good to see a lot of people engaging uh, with this and uh, we will of course email everyone who's been here with uh, more information um, from phil martin and from open rights group um, so that you can help you know just to help your responses uh, when you make them so thanks again very much you've got uh, a week to uh, get this all done a week and two days so thank you and uh, I'm no doubt we will all uh, see and speak again.